teach you how to get to that stage where you can use them with them, right? Uh, the honors people, I'll warn you, this might be a little different than this kind of talk because I need to prepare you with kind of in a a B ish kind of way, I'll explain. And the whole time you're going to be thinking, this is crazy, I can use an integral, but tough, bump it. You're going to use it this way, and then we'll use an integral once you've paid your dues. Um, let's go with the easy part here. First, the easy part is the base. When you divide the region into some number of chunks, it's a horizontal division, so you're getting bases. Now, those bases are horizontal. Rather than call them B now, I'm going to call them delta X, okay? So, uh, say you have the region under the X squared graph, which doesn't really matter for this part, and you wanted to divide it, the region from 0 to 6 in 6 chunks. What would the base of each be? The base, which is delta X is 1. Now, preferably then, we would generalize this. I know that was super easy, but how did you find 1? Analyze, please. Six minus, six minus zero over six. six. So would you please up here write delta x equals, generally speaking, b minus a over n if the interval goes from a to b and n rectangles is the number of rectangles. You take the total width of the region, which is the end point minus the starting point, divide it by how many, and that will tell you what each one's base is. So, what is base or delta x for 2? 1 half. What is delta x for 3? 6 fifths. What's delta x for 4 for the next row? 6 sevenths. And more generally, the fifth one? Six over n. Now that's what we will typically do is divide it into n chunks, not a, a, fine, a defined or finite number of chunks, but an undefined number of chunks. What about the last? B minus a over n. Okay. Now then, that's the basis of each rectangle. The second component is the heights. The heights are where things start to get a little more complicated here, but not much. Um, if, for this case, the delta x was one half, and I was using right-hand rectangles, we're going to focus on right-hand rectangles to develop this idea, then the heights would all be how high did you go to get to the curve at different places in the, in the region, right? So they will always be, the height is always f at sum x. Now that little i is to say it's going to count up in an incremental way. First x, second x, third x, fourth x, until you get to the end of the region. So if I, in this problem, wanted to talk about the heights at which I would be finding, or the x's at which I'd be finding my heights, the first one would be f at what? Oops, this was delta x of 1, wasn't it? Yeah. Sorry. If, I, if my first region was from 0 to 1, and I used the right endpoint, then my first height would be f at 1. The next height would be f at 2. For all these, I think we'll find the first two and then the last one. And so the last one would be f at, what's the last height we would find? f at what height? 6, because that's the end of the region, right? All right. So what about this second one? We said delta x was a half. So the first height, the first region would be from 0 to a half. And if I use the right side, I'd find the function at 1 half. And then f at k. Now here's where I demand that you not simplify. And you'll see why. So don't call it 1, but call it 2 halves, 3 halves through how many halves? Six halves. And six halves is three, which is the right endpoint. You'll see we're going to do that because our goal is to detect patterns. I don't care about one or three. I want to see a pattern in this to write summation notation to it. And it's much easier to see a pattern if you leave it unsimplified. Okay? Um, so 
would you please continue on then and do the other three and we'll check to see if we agree. So what I'm saying is find f at one six fifths, f at two six fifths through f at that's the last number of six fifths. How many six how many rectangles? Five. So the last one is the fifth six fifths, which actually simplifies to six. And that's how it's supposed to be. Okay. Now again, you might think, why are you making things so complicated? It'll pay off in a second. Okay, but you're counting each six fifths is a mark over, and you're just going over by a six fifth each time in an incremental way. That's going to help us write summation notation to this. If it's written that way, one six fifth, two six fifths, three six fifths, two five six fifths in this case. Don't do the last one. It's not uh, it's overreach on my part. I didn't get through as much as I needed to because I overreached. So it's more good. Uh, are we ready for the fourth one? So the first x at which we find a height is six sevenths. Then we go to f at two six sevenths. It might seem a small point, but it's important that you write two times six sevenths, not two six sevenths, because, yeah, that looks like two and six sevenths, not two times six sevenths. Are you with me? So that's kind of important. Small point, but important. Two six sevenths through the, how many six sevenths do I, will I do all together? Seven six sevenths, and that's completely by virtue of how many rectangles they told you to use, we would do n of these six sevenths rectangles. Okay? Last but not least, f at 6 over n, f at 2 times 6 over n, or 2 6 over n's through n 6 over n's exactly, which reduces to 6's, and that is exactly where I'm supposed to end. Okay? With me. Okay. Well, we have the base, we have the height. Well, then when we get the area, we'll put the two together. This is the easiest step. If I put the two together, then it would look something like, this will just take a second. Uh, this first one, so actually, let's go here. I'm going to write the area then would be the basis, which is delta x, because it's the same for all. I can factor it up front. And inside will be all my heights that I just wrote. So this one might be 6 over n times f at 1 6 over n, 2 6 over n through n 6 over n. And that would give me my area estimate of 6 rectangles. Okay. Would you do the others? Putting the delta x out front and the heights inside and you've done all the work the hard work already you're just putting the two steps together uh should that have been six somewhere in or one f at one two three and so on right sorry i i'm getting ahead of myself that's where we're headed but we're not there yet
Okay. Do you have stuff that looks like that? So we're just putting the two components together. You with me? Yes. Thank you. Please, Pete and Daniel. Good job. Chat? You cool? I don't. All right. Now, uh, this is the part that students tend to get uh, a little, uh, I don't know. It looks a little intimidating, but it shouldn't be. But first pause for something that I didn't probably put big enough in my notes here. These area estimates are called Riemann sums, named after uh, a German mathematician who's estimating area in a curve using rectangles, this going towards infinity idea. If you see Riemann sum, think rectangle area. It is crucial that you have that vocabulary down in your head because on my test, on the AP test, it'll say uh, estimate this using a Riemann sum. Now, if you don't know that Riemann sum means rectangle, you're not going to really know what to do to start. Right? You have to know that connection. Riemann sum is the same as rectangle area. You cannot come up to me during the test and say, do you mean rectangles here? Because I'll say, that's part of the concept, get out of here. You can't go to the AP test and ask Ms. Harrington, hey, do they, does this Riemann something mean rectangles? She's going to say, get out of here. I cannot help you. It's part of the problem to understand vocabulary. Riemann means rectangles. Cool? All right, then. Um, we're going to start using, instead of what I, I call this expanded form, yeah, many people do, we're going to use summation notation. For all of these, we've got this base out front, and that's fine, but inside is this tedious sum with the dot, 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 and all this writing. Well, there's a better way for writing sums with a pattern within, and that's the summation notation. Right? So we're going to use summation notation because it's a natural. It would be far cleaner than all this. The idea is still the same. I'm going to have a base times the sum of many heights. The base is always the same, so it can be factored out front. In fact, it can actually even be factored out front of the summation, too, and we will do that. The heights are really the sum, the star of the show. That's where the sum will be, is the height function. If I then wanted to express this here problem, same problem, but in summation notation, I could do it this way. Now, I want you to do it. I'm, if you read this, I'm trying to break this into some more manageable, less intimidating chunks by doing it in two steps. The first thing we're going to do is put in the specific delta x. So instead of delta x generally, for this problem, delta x is 6 over n. Okay? 6 over 1. Why did you tell me it's not 6 over, it's 6 divided by 6, which is 1. Good call. Uh, that'll be where we're headed. Sorry, I'm again getting ahead of myself. 1, right? In terms of the function, we'll leave f as f right now, but inside, actually, clean this up so I keep it nice and clean. Inside is f at different values. Now, the f is always the same. The parentheses are always the same. But you can see there's a pattern inside. It goes 1, 2, dot, 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 through 6. Well, summation notation deals with that then. It first of all says, all right, what's the counter? We will use i or k. Um, they're the most common. I typically use i. We identify the counter variable there. And we start by saying, what's the first I we use? Well, in this case, the first I was 1. And up here, you put the last I you went up to, which in this case was 6. And then you say, all right, the counter, where is it in the pattern? It's every time it's in the F argument. So in there, F at different I's, F at 1 through 6. Pattern. If you then get a little more specific then and say the formula at hand, in this case, f is blank squared, and inside the squaring each time we're putting in up. Okay? It's f of i 
f is x squared, so i squared. We put in the function for this problem. Now that was only because this problem was x squared. The next one's x cubed, so it's not going to be there. This guy, in two steps, I start by saying, all right, I'm talking about the sum of bases of a half times f at, and look at what's always the same and what's different. f is always the same. The parentheses are always the same. Over 2 is always the same. And that which is counting is just the numerator. 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, up until you get to 6 over 2. So if I start my i at, what's the first i in? I'm looking at the numerator. 1, and it ends in 6. Now, people want to say from 1 half to 3, but remember, I'm just saying the numerator is i. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So in terms of the numerators, they start at 1 and end at 6. And the pattern is always f of blank over 2. And that counter is some number of 1 halves. 1 1 half, 2 1 half, 3 1 half, 4 1 half. i is the number of 1 half. So you follow? If I then go over and substitute in for the function in the next step, in this case, the function is cubing. And so what goes into the cube? i over 2. Look inside the parentheses to say what puts into the function. And inside the function goes i over 2. Okay? Try, try the others. This is still stretched out. Don't do the last one. So the next one, do you have something like 6 fifths times f of i 6 fifths? Yes? How many i's starting from where and going to where? 1 fifth, 2 fifths, through 5 fifths. So i goes from 1 to 5. All right? So you should have a starting value of summation from 1 to 5 of 6 fifths f at i of 6 fifths. But then you replace f at with 2 blank plus 1. And inside blank goes the i at 6 fifths. So you're putting in delta x and the, the i expression, and then you're replacing the function. If that went well, try the other two. If it didn't go well, then come talk to me. Let me know as I walk through.
How did you do? This is your final last answer. This is your final second answer. Going okay? Okay. Gentlemen? Okay. All right. So now let's start to work towards uh, getting an infinite limit. Uh, this is such a freak of mess, you're not going to get anywhere with the limit on that. Because, I mean, what's, what do you take the limit on? It's a mess. So now it's about cleanup here. There have been, in the homeworks, these formulas at the end of a few problem sets, maybe two or three, they've given you something like, hey, did you know that you can find the sum of squares from one through any number by this formula? Verify it works for three and then do four. Does this sound familiar? Okay, now those formulas were actually used to set the stage for today's lesson. Um, I can, despite the fact it feels like there's so much going on here, you can eventually strip it down to just the sum of squares here, or the sum of cubes, or the sum of first degree and squares, with a little work. Now that is the part that requires a little bit of algebra work. I will show lots of steps today, but you'll, as you get good at these, you'll start to do this in less and less steps, and it'll go really well. But you want to strip this crazy base height calculation down to just the sum of squares or cubes. Now, that's the goal. Let me show you what I'm saying here. Would you, first of all, let's get away from, our goal is eventually get away from six rectangles and get it to and rectangles and go infinitely many. So this time, we're going to say, what if this region of this curve from 0 to 6 is just any basic number of rectangles? Well, first and foremost, the area would be the bases. Now, if now the region is 6 wide and I'm dividing it into n chunks, how wide is each chunk? 6 over n. Okay, we take the total region and divide it into whatever number of chunks. And the height would be f at the first, I think, if you think visually along the base, I would have from 0 to the first 6 over n, and then to the second 6 over n, and to the third 6 over n. So the heights would always be at the right side, so the ith 6 over n. And we just count over 6 over n until we got to the far right edge of the region, right? In terms of the counters, they would always start from the first 6 over n because we're starting with, we're using right hand rectangles. And we're going to end at the last point, which would be the last rectangle, generally speaking, the nth rectangle, whatever that is going to be. All right, so it's, it's a lot like before, but now instead of having a concrete base like 1 or 1 half, we're just talking in general 6 divided into n chunks, and that's each base. Before, or the step we just did, we replaced this function then with what the function is. The function is to square whatever you put in. And what I'm putting in every time is some multiple of 6 over it. Yeah? All right. Now, you can see then that it's pretty... The, the goal, actually, let me go here. The goal, as I said, is to strip away the complicated stuff and get it down to what's the sum of squares or cubes. Now, this one squares because the function is squared. So I'm going to try and isolate just that. And that's actually pretty easy to do because the counter is only about how i behaves anyway. So this 6 over n stuff, I can pull it out front. I can, first of all, I could take each of these separately, and it would be 6 over n squared and i squared. And because that's, that's kind of like a limit problem where the limit isn't about that function, because this is n-ish, not i-ish, I can pull it out front and call it 216 if I multiplied all those 6s out over n cubed, and just focus on, that's like the greatest common factor I just took out, and say what would then the sum of all those squares be? Well, at that point then, 
I could say, look, that's, there's a formula for that. The formula for i squared is that. If I added 1 squared plus 2 squared, so on, through n squared, then the sum can always be found by virtue of that formula. n times n plus 1 over 2 n plus 1 over 6. Now the point in the next step we'll see is that I couldn't take an infinite limit on this. I couldn't take the number of rectangles to this because the summation notation. But this, I can take into infinity on. End behavior. And it'll go really easy. Okay? That's for the next step. So for each of these, our goal is to start with the function, identify the bases and heights, put in the function, isolate the i, and replace the i. All right? That's the idea. And actually, I'm going to write that down, all right? Put in the base and the height. Um, sub in the function. And then our goal is to isolate the i term and replace with a formula. All right, so let's do... One more together, and then I'll let you do the other three on your own. So for this, if instead of six rectangles, I did n rectangles, then what is the base of each rectangle? The region is how wide? Three divided into n chunks, so the base of each is a single three over n. The height, then, would be at the first three over n mark, the second three over n mark. So generally speaking, the i of 3 over n mark. I'm just, I would just count 3 over n's over until I'd done the whole region. And I would start, because I'm using right-hand rectangles, from the first 3 over n, which is the right side of the first region, to the last, which is the nth 3 over n. And the nth 3 over n would just be 3, which is what it should end at, right? All right, so now, replace with the function. In this case... 3 over n stays, but instead of the function, I'm going to say blank q. And in that blank is the i of 3 over n. If I then isolate the i term, I could cube each of those guys separately, and all together, how many 3's would I have, and, could, and I could put that up front. One there, and three more there, so all together I'd have 3 to the 4th, or 81 if I expand it. You follow? And how many n's? n to the 4th. And that would be then inside the summation would still be the i term, which is i cubed. Well, at that point, I've isolated i cubed. I have a formula for the sum of numbers cubed. It's this guy here. And if I replace that summation with that formula, n times n plus 1 all over 2 quantity squared, and I could, again, in the next step, take the infinite formula. Now, these formulas, uh, I will always give them to you. I do not expect you to memorize them. They're not a huge thing that's worth memorizing. They will not be expected to memorize them on the AP test. So don't sweat committing those to memory. I'll give you just the whole four, and you can figure out what to use and when. Uh, but try the next one. Uh, oh, the next one's a little. The next one's a little funky. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but I also don't want to leave it to the wolves. The next one's a little funky because it's got two terms. All right, so walk with me through this next one, and then I'll shut up and let you try some. Uh, for this, what's the base of each rectangle? Six over n, and the heights are f at what? I 6 over n, some number of 6 over n, okay? When I go to substitute in the function, I'll get 6 over n, and the function is 2 blank plus 1, generally speaking. And in that blank goes I 6 over n. All right, uh, one of the things you'll often need to do then is if you get a sum you'll want to split into two summations. 
So, for example, if I distributed this, first of all, I would have 6 times 2 times 6, which is 72 over n squared i's. And then if I distributed 6 over n to 1, I'd have just 6 over n. I distributed the base n. You with me? All right. The rule that you're going to want to use is I don't have the formula. I don't have a formula for each of these guys uh, together, so I'm going to separate them. I can call this 72. Oops, 72 over some 72 over n squared times the sum of the i terms plus 6 over n times the sum of however many 6 over n. It's really if I pull a 6 over n out front, then what's left in? 1, yeah. 1 to n, 1 to n. So then, if I employ the formula, or formulas in this case, 72 over n squared is cool. What's the sum of just plain old first degree terms? 1, 2, 3, so on through n. Which of those is it? Upper right, lower left, upper right, okay, n times n plus 1 over 2 plus, this is 6 over n times this. It's funny, but it just means add 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, how many times? n times. What's 1 added to itself n times? N. 1 n times is n times 1. C n times is C times n. Okay? All right. Uh, and then we can take our formula. So, in that case, we had a sum, and we eventually, after distributing, we're able to split it into two separate summations. Try those other two, and we'll go over that. See if you're on the right track. Yes? This step? Yeah. Uh, Gosh, uh, in terms of recognizing this on a multiple choice problem, I would strongly recommend against it. Um, uh, I, I know it feels like tedium, uh, and I understand, but uh, trust me, it'll pay off. You put it on. That's, a, that's a worthwhile question. Uh, the part that I can let you skip around on is the isolation. And I. I sometimes go fairly slowly on the isolation. So, for example, here, if you went straight from here to there, that I'm okay with. If you can cut the algebra down, that's fine with me. case, just use in rectangles, not any more specific seven or six or whatever. For the next one, you have something like 6 over n times 2 over n for the first quantity minus 216 over n cubed times the formula n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Is that what you have? Okay, good.
about the last one. You have something like 36 over n squared times the formula n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 216 over n cubed times the formula n times n plus 1 over 2 n plus 1 over. How are we doing? Yes. I got a question. So sure. on like the third problem when you were um, yeah, multiplying the six n across the two yeah. the plus it's one like distributing, yeah. Yeah, you should be right. You like you know, you like the next step is seventy two over n cubed right. Right, plus six n and then like on the fourth problem you just left it as you didn't like multiply two to the six. Um, I oh I see what you're saying here. I didn't really multiply. It, it's so. Let me ask you this. This actually, there's two different ways you could have done this. If you had 12 over n and one here, that would be fine. Oh okay. yeah, absolutely. Uh, you would end up in the same place because you'd have 12 over n and one in here, so it's fine. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's I see what you're saying. Okay, are we good? No. Sorry. Uh, when yes. you have a term like 6 over n squared, do you have to simplify that to 36 over n squared, or can you just leave it as 6, six over n squared? Square? Uh, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. That will be fine. Are we almost done copying dutifully? Go for it. That's the spirit. All right. So, um, actually, it's it's there's so much work going on and so much writing that it's easy to lose sight of what the heck this is. It's just now at this point it starts to be just a bunch of blah 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 blah. Okay? So imagine if I asked you on Friday's homework, find the area under x squared from zero to six using two right hand rectangles. Okay, we, we could do that. But then if I just said, all right, now use three rectangles, then you could go through the whole mumbo jumbo. Five rectangles, seven rectangles. Um, what we just created here would be a formula that would give me the area under this using any number of rectangles. And if I wanted to estimate the area of the curve using two rectangles, I could just use this formula, plug in two, there's my estimate. If I said use five rectangles, I could just use this formula, plug in five, there's my estimate. Um, so this is the, a formula that would find the area under the curve using any number of rectangles. And like we said at the start, the more rectangles you use, the better the estimate of the area of the curve. So it's logical then to take this formula and let the number of rectangles go to infinity or grow without bound. That's the next step then, or the last step. You'll be happy to know it's also the last step. Okay? So if on that x squared on 0 to 6, I wanted the perfect area. I could take the expression I found for the area, which was 216 over n cubed times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. That gives me the area of any number of rectangles. And I could take the limit on it as n goes to infinity or let the number of rectangles grow without bounds so that I get a perfect area. Now this, thankfully, we have, we can do pretty quickly just by looking at n behavior. If I multiplied all this out, it would be blah, 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 n cubed, n squared, n, and so on, right? And the bottom would be 6n cubed. Now do I need to look at all those terms when I do an infinite limit? Or can I just focus on the greatest power terms, right? So what's the greatest power term with coefficient in the numerator? It's 216 times, and you could cancel out ends and all that stuff. I don't typically do that. But I would say 216 times 2 n cubed. The coefficients would be 216 and 2, and the, all the ends would amount to n cubed. And on the bottom, I would have 6 n cubed. As n gets infinitely large, this would start to approach just 216 times 2 over 6, or I guess at this point I can reduce it. 6 goes into 216 nicely. How many times? 36, 36 times. 36 times 2 is 72. Now that's not 
an estimate of the area under y equals x squared. That is the area under y equals x squared from 0 to 6. Exactly. Okay? And if I actually did a million problems, if I did two rectangles, looked at my estimate, then did four rectangles, looked at my estimate, they would start to get gradually, gradually, gradually towards 72. Okay? Now, we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of each of our area formulas. So for that second one, it was 81 over n to the fourth times the formula, which I'll remember, 81 over n to the fourth, n times n plus 1, all squared, all over 2. So as n goes to infinity, this would start to approach just the lead term. What would it be? 81 n to the fourth over the denominator, 2 n to the fourth. Notice the square. It's 4 into the 4th. Okay, be careful with that square. It's 4 into the 4th. That would then approach. And you would force. That also is the perfect area. Yes? I, uh, should I be writing it here? Yeah, pretty much I should. Good point. Thank you. Okay, so if you understand the idea, then would you knock out the other three infinite limits? Uh, I don't know if I gave you enough room or if I didn't give you enough room. I'm having a hard time figuring out if I spaced this well or not. So this one is 72 squared. What'd you get for the next one? 42. Did you get negative 60? What is that on the graph? What? What is a negative area? Oh, uh, yeah. So in terms of area, it doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. But uh, there are going to be a lot of times in calculus where you want negatives to happen. That's actually be 
the whole thing will have to go in. Sometimes area doesn't, shouldn't be negative, sometimes it should. In terms of this problem here, the area, the curve, 2 minus x squared on 0 to 6, is a downward opening parabola. And if you think about using rectangles, the bases are always delta x's. We go left to right. The bases are always defined to be positive, always. But you can see the heights here. Because the area is drawing from f values for the heights, you're getting negative area because the curve has negative y is there. It's, this is like the net area. It's the change between the positive area and the negative area. Um, and sometimes that's good to answer your question. But why it's negative is because the curve is below the axis for so much. All right. Last one. Uh, for the last one, did you get something like 18 plus 72, so 90? Or not? Maybe I'm rushing. I think that's what I get. Well, we'll just see. Oh. So the last one is just an actual doing the problem all the way through. Try it. Post the key online so as to minimize questions. It will not be a long meeting done by 3.30, but it will be an important one. Thanks. We'll discuss audition requirements, schedule, and expectations. This is for all interested participants, whether you'd like to be on stage, off stage, or in the pit. Come to find out, come find out about what it's going to be an epic good time.
Did I make an error? Where is it? I used the wrong formula. Oh, yeah. You used just the regular formula. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 I will absolutely try to skip. To me, it doesn't even exist. So you might as well leave a blank if you're going to do that. Okay, I'll do that. I'll just not do the homework at all. As you wish. So this is not that, it's more like a hundred and eighty times two over six. Uh, have a great day. 64 plus 68, maybe? I got it. I got it. It's so grateful. All right. Have a great day.